In chapter five, we're going to learn all about alkenes and the structure of an alkene, nomenclature of an alkene. I will touch on those first two things in this video. And then an introduction to reactivity, including how thermodynamics and kinetics can affect a reaction. And those ideas, which we get in the back half of chapter five, kind of set the framework for the rest of the reaction. Okay? It's within chapter five here that you get your first reaction. And we do those reactions throughout the rest of the semester and in organic two. Okay? So we'll get some slight review in regard to thermodynamics and kinetics, but then we'll get some new stuff that we'll build on in the next several weeks. So the first thing, what is an alkene? Okay, we had alkanes before. Alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons. Okay, but alkenes have at least one degree of unsaturation, meaning that they have at least one pi bond. Okay, so if we say an alkene right now, we're just going to think about it as something that has one pi bond. So whereas an alkane had the formula CnH2n plus two, an alkene has lost two of those hydrogens when it formed a double bond. So the general formula for a non-cyclic alkene is CnH2n, right, where n is an integer. If you have a cyclic alkene, you had to lose two additional hydrogens to form the ring. Right? So if you have a cyclic alkene, your formula is CnH2n minus two. Okay. And however many pi bonds or rings you have, that's known as a degree of unsaturation. So something that has one degree of unsaturation either has a pi bond or a ring. Something that has two degrees of unsaturation could have two pi bonds, two rings, or a ring and a pi bond. It's a quick way to predict right, the sum of these things. And the way you do it, right, is you take your molecular formula, if it were saturated, okay, so that's CnH2n plus two, and then you lose two hydrogens for every pi bond or ring, right? That's every degree of unsaturation. So right here, right? If we take this cyclopentene, it has two degrees of unsaturation, right? Because if it were fully saturated, C5H2N plus two, it would be C5H12, but it's C5H8, okay? So 12 minus eight is four, and then you divide that number by two to get your degree of unsaturation because it's two pairs of hydrogen each time. Or sorry, two hydrogen, a single pair of hydrogen. Okay, so if you have a degree of unsaturation, that means you've lost two hydrogens to either form a ring or form a pi bond. Okay. So if we take C8H14, for example, okay, if it was 2N plus two, that would be H18, C8H18. So 18 minus 14, again, means I have two degrees of unsaturation. So that could be two separate pi bonds. That's called a diene, a pi bond and a ring, two rings, or a triple bond, right, which has two pi bonds within it. So you should know how to determine degrees of unsaturation and given a formula, predict a possible structure, okay, given those degrees of unsaturation. Okay. Know the difference, I used these terms already in the beginning of the video between saturated and unsaturated. Right? If something is saturated, it has the maximum number of carbon hydrogen bonds possible. And so it can't have any double bonds. If it's unsaturated, it has fewer than the maximum. It has one or more double bonds. So if you have one alkene, or sorry, one degree of unsaturation, that is an alkene. And it's the same way with fats, right? You hear saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Something's unsaturated if it has at least one double bond. Okay. So how do we name these things? Okay. What's the nomenclature of alkenes? This is, again, based on the rules that we learned for IUPAC nomenclature in Chapter 3. Okay. We learned how to name alkanes. And if you're naming an alkene, instead of having the ending A-N-E, you have the ending E-N-E. -E. Okay, so we go from ethane to ethene, propane to propene. And in this case, the double bond is the functional group. That's why it's controlling your suffix. 
But if we're following this IUPAC system of nomenclature, right, we have to have a number to indicate where the functional group is. But a double bond goes to two carbons. So what do I do? Well, the functional group gets the lowest possible number. So you use the number for the position where the double bond starts. It's a quick way to remember it. You don't provide the number for both carbons. It's just the carbon that the double bond is touching with the lower number. Keeping in mind, you always have to have the longest continuous chain that contains the functional group. Right, so looking at this molecule at the bottom, I could have gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and named that as octane, but that carbon chain up top doesn't contain the functional group, which is why it's named as hexene, with the number where the double bond starts, carbon one in this case. So one hexene or hex one ene, either one is acceptable. Okay. If you have something that's cis or trans, Right, which you will have in any situation except for when the double bond is going to carbon one, because right, then you would have two hydrogens on the same side. You need to name it as cis or trans if you have hydrogens that are opposite one another. Remember this from chapter four, right? Cis or trans refers to hydrogens. Right? If you don't have cis or trans, then you have to use the EZ system of nomenclature to have a full name. Right, so we're taking ideas from chapter three, four, and five now for nomenclature for the second exam. So make sure you're familiar with all these rules. Okay. So cis or trans, if you have the hydrogens, E or Z, if you don't. Okay. And again, you're always giving the functional group the lowest number, just like you did when we were naming alkanes. So I recommend you look at these on the individual slides, look at these names for practice. Right, reason each of them, cover the name up and practice doing it on your own. Only other thing to draw your attention to, we learned two alcohols before, right? It's a diol, if you have two alkenes, it's a diene, right? One alkene, two alkenes, diene. Okay. If you have three of them, it's a triene, four, tetraene, etc. And we'll talk more about those properties in chapter eight. How about if we have substituents? Well, we're gonna have those all the time. You still just put your substituents in alphabetical order, no different than what we had before. I right? put the substituents in alphabetical order, number your longest carbon chain to give the functional group, the alkene in this case, the lower number, and then assign the numbers to your substituents. If you get the same number going the same way for the functional group, then you defer to your substituents. Right, so in these situations, both going both ways would give you four octene or three hexene. So you look at your substituents. Anytime there's a tie, right, just go up the chain, give the next lowest possible number. If you have a cyclic alkene, something with two degrees of unsaturation, right, you don't need a number to denote the location of the functional group because you always assume it's between C1 and C2. Right, you'll notice earlier in the video, I said cyclopentene. I didn't have to call it one cyclopentene. Right? It's always carbon one to carbon two, which makes numbering your substituents super easy. Okay. And then here's two more for practice. Right? Keeping in mind, you could go either way around the ring. So you look at your substituents to give them the lower number. Looking at the lowest number overall, plenty of practice there for you to work on for on slide 13 and 14 prior to the exam. If you're in doubt, just remember the general formula. We got this in chapter three, here it again, is again in chapter five. Your parent hydrocarbon in the middle, your functional group suffix at the end, right? In this case, we're using ene for alkenes and your substituents with their numbers at the beginning. Okay. So that's the nomenclature. A couple of vocab terms to finish the section with. Okay. If we have an alkene, we have some special properties to our carbons. So I call the carbons that are involved in the alkene itself, vinylic carbons. They're sp2 hybridized because of that pi bond. Those are called vinylic carbons. And the same name applies to the hydrogens if they're attached to them. These would be called vinylic hydrogens as well. The next carbon out from those vinylic carbons, just going one carbon away, are called allylic 
carbons. Okay? So they're one sigma bond away from a vinylic carbon. That's an allylic carbon. And these are important terms, both in nomenclature and describing mechanisms and behavior of molecules. Sometimes you see them in common names as well, like vinyl chloride or allyl bromide. <clears throat> Those are not used in IUPAC nomenclature, only in the common naming system. But you will occasionally see me refer to a vinyl group or an allyl group. Those can appear in our substituent names as well. Right here, this is a vinyl group as a substituent. This is an allyl group. All right. So what is our structure of an alkene? Okay, I've got my vinylic carbons in the middle, four allylic carbons on the outside in this case, because there are no vinylic hydrogens. We've got a bunch of allylic methyl group. Um, the P orbitals in the middle here that are overlapping one another to form the pi bond. Right, so we're looking at this bond here. This is the functional group. Uh, sigma bonds without here, pi bond above and below. So notice where that electron density is, above and below. And all of these carbons in the middle, there's six of them, are all in the same plane, right? That's a big plane of carbons with electron density above and below. And that is what's going to affect our reactivity. Okay. All of those carbons that are highlighted, so each of the sp2 carbons plus the methyl groups that are bonded to them, they're all in the same plane. Those points are defining a plane. Right? And to get the maximum orbital overlap, that p orbital must be completely perpendicular to that plane. And that's important to keep the geometry of those six carbons in mind as we discuss the reactivity of these things moving forward. So important takeaways from this first section, right? know how to determine degrees of unsaturation. If you're given a formula or degrees of unsaturation, right, be able to predict some possible structures that could come from that. Every degree of unsaturation could be a pi bond or a ring. Know the nomenclature of alkenes, which if you're good with nomenclature from chapter three, the only new thing is introducing the ENE suffix here for an alkene. Okay. And then no vinylic and allylic, what those mean, and the structure of an alkene. We'll use that idea moving forward in our next video where we start to look at reactions of these things.